I don't need to tell you that the series From is one of the most convoluted with mysteries, secrets, plot twists, and constant confusion. That's how you can describe this project. But if you're watching this video, then you, like me, want to get answered. And that's normal. You've come to the right place because today, in this video, we'll try to put together the puzzle and create a coherent picture. The 10th episode of the second season, perhaps, is one of the most interesting. It gave us many answers and at the same time, even more questions. So what do we already know? There are three dimensions, worlds, or locations where events in the series take place. The reality itself, where people come from, the town and the living forest, where you can't escape, and one might say the connecting dimension beyond time, where all the answers are. Behind these locations, three trees are responsible in which portals are located. The roots of these trees are connected and they form that strange symbol that Jade sees on the walls in Christopher's diary. And finally, in the dungeon. The trees in the magical forest constantly move, so there will come a time when the roots of these three main portal trees will intertwine and the slaughter will begin again. And the main antagonist and god of this place will be freed. But to stop this process, a sacrifice of seven children is needed. It has always been this way. It is now, and it has happened more than once in the past. The boy in white living in the lighthouse knows everything or thinks he knows everything. And every time he writes down the dates on the lighthouse wall when the roots intertwine, trying to somehow defeat the evil. In the first season, we were led to believe that Tabitha, being a child in the past, had already been in this place. Memories of the lighthouse come to her and at the end of the season, in the reflection of the window, we see a completely different Tabitha. Perhaps she is the missing sister of Victor Eloise, but much doesn't add up. And that's normal because the timelines from outside and in the town aren't as intertwined as in the existing reality. Well, let's start from the beginning. We know that everything shown in the series so far carries a lot of information. We've been misled so many times thinking it's all a quest, a universal conspiracy, or a borderline social experiment that all the characters are actually in a coma and much more. But we'll find the truth. This is the gaze for you channel and we're doing a comprehensive analysis of the series from. We'll consider all the theories, find the answers, and try to guess what the third season will be like. I promise it will be interesting. Let's begin. So I had to rewatch all the episodes at a speed of 0.25 to notice some moments. And I want to start with the simplest and end, of course, with the answers. But to understand everything happening in the series, I advise not to fast forward the video and watch it from beginning to end so you won't lose the subtle thread of the narrative and to avoid confusing you even more than the series itself. I suggest dividing the video into parts and the first part will be called Location, Setting, and Buildings. So let's get started. In the first episode, we have a couple of moments. The first one is the city itself. It has a post office, a railway, poles, houses. Someone must have built all this. We know that until a certain moment, everything was fine. The city lived its life until monsters destroyed all the residents in one night. But from the overall picture, the church immediately stands out. It is much older than the city. It is noticeable and stands out strongly. The same underground cellar where Victor hid, they were all built around the same time as the shelter in the forest where Boyd found the talismans of protection. And that strange lighthouse, clearly from the same era. These structures are older than the city itself, and it is precisely to these places that all the portals located in the trees lead. Sarah ended up in the church basement, Julia in the cellar, and Tabitha in the lighthouse. The second aspect, where exactly the city is located, is unknown. The fallen tree that blocks the road appears in all states. There is no consistency, at least not as far as we can tell from the first season. Near the city, there is a field with seven stones where the Holy Father often prays. Clearly, a ritual was performed in this place. Someone had to bring huge boulders here and place them in a circle. The number seven appears throughout the series. We have seven stones on which children are sacrificially tied. These same stones are depicted on the walls of the dungeon where the monsters live, and there are seven boulders in the field. And again, the newly arrived grandmother, the dark horse, prays in a circle of seven people. But there are eight trees depicted on the stone talisman. This is the only inconsistency, as I believe that the talisman indicates the number of trees with portals. The entire settlement is located in the center of the forest, and this forest is alive. Trees can move, as Victor himself said. This happens constantly. The entire forest is a vast organism. If you suddenly want to leave the city and try to get out, you're unlikely to be allowed to do so. There are many options and methods of control. The first and simplest is the nocturnal monsters, the main antagonists of the first two seasons. In the past, they were people who lived in this city at different times, including soldiers from the first civil war. They sleep during the day in the dungeon, under the city and the forest, 
and come out at night to hunt. Therefore, there isn't much time for location exploration, which is very convenient for those who want to keep victims in the city. Even if you manage to hide in a tent with a stone talisman, the trees are aggressive at night too. We see that they attack Boyd and Sarah, although we didn't notice such behavior during the day. The third method of control is spiders. We haven't paid much attention to them, but it's clear that they are not friendly either. In fact, they are often seen in Victor's drawings. It's barely noticeable, but I carefully analyzed them, and I managed to find them in Victor's drawings. And finally, if all these methods fail, you can summon a storm. Weather is a clear and final known method of control, not to mention cicadas and constant hallucinations, which can drive you insane. The place itself is unreal. Everything that happens there is unnatural. Electricity is drawn from the air, all wires run underground, and that's where they end their path. In addition to this, we were shown three portal trees. As Victor said, they are different. Some will lead you into the unknown, while the bottle tree will transport you to the lighthouse. Personally, I think there are eight such portals. They are located around the city itself, and they are depicted on the protective talisman stone. These trees! We've deviated from the topic a bit, but all these things are simply interconnected, and it's hard to unravel the tangle without touching all the threads. I've mentioned before that in the series, we were shown three worlds. The city itself, the reality where all people came from, and as I called it, the anomaly, where all the answers are stored. This became clear for the first time when Boyd entered the building where Martin was tied up. We'll talk about the actual meeting later. The main thing is that Boyd managed to use the light from a lit torch to get back there and destroy the box. But before that, Sarah heard the musical box. You probably already forgot, but it's not the first time she's felt unwell and heard voices. In the first season, she had exactly the same behavior near the tree where the bottles were hanging. Judging by this information, there's an anomaly there too, and we need to use light to see everything written in the notes inside the bottles. And let me tell you right away, that's not the same bottle tree that Tabitha stumbled upon and ended up at the lighthouse. You can compare, it's clear they're different. Boyd took off one bottle, and there was a date, 1864. The same date is engraved on the walls of the lighthouse, so there are nine such bottle trees, and each corresponds to its date. By the way, I almost forgot, when Tabitha first entered the lighthouse in her visions, she stepped on a bottle. She slowly falls down the stairs. It's the same bottle that Boyd took off the tree, so it's empty. Clearly, someone left clues, but who and when, we'll figure that out at the end of the video. Jade finds the same anomaly, but he only sees the past. But perhaps the flame of the torch could show the whole picture. And the last structure is the lighthouse. It's all very strange. It constantly operates and seems to be situated in the coastal area or on an island, and its main task is to serve as a landmark for ships. But when Tabitha enters the lighthouse, we don't see any sea or signs of an ocean or river. Perhaps we just haven't been shown everything. There's a boy in white living there, whom we'll talk about later, but I also believe that the lighthouse is the only way to escape from this dimension. That's why the boy pushes Tabitha, although he could have talked to her, explained everything. But then perhaps Tabitha wouldn't have wanted to leave her family. It's a debatable question that we'll only be able to understand after watching the third season. The next part of the video is drawings. All the drawings, those made by Victor, those left by monsters in the dungeon, and what is depicted on the stone talisman of protection. Let's consider everything that was shown to us in the series. And for starters, the most interesting thing for me is the dungeon, the house where monsters live and sleep. Victor says that they are drawn by underground inhabitants. Perhaps it is so, but if we look at the stone talisman, then we will understand that the one who created the talisman and the one who drew in the dungeon are most likely the same person because we can see that the trees are depicted the same way, as well as the little people. But in the dungeon, everything is drawn in small details and only three colors were used, white, red, and black. I think this is important. Now you will all understand. First, let's consider what is drawn in white. On the left, we see a forest and people. At first glance, it seems like they are in boats, but then how do they sail through the forest? But if you look closely, you can see a road drawn in black. Next, there is an image of a tree. Here, it indicates how people get to the city. They move along the road, encountering a fallen tree blocking the way. By the way, it's also depicted in the drawing, here it is. At the bottom and the top, we can see the same arcs as on the talisman, most likely symbolizing a portal between our world and the city. Next, we see some kind of ritual, which was shown to us in the 10th episode of the second season. Jade became the first witness of the ritual. Here are seven stones. Children are tied to them, lying on their backs, and their gaze is directed towards the intertwined roots. Below, there is a group of people most likely located in the underground, and above, a couple of people can be seen holding hands, looking down at what is happening. For some reason, I feel that these same two people are also on the right. Here they are, and here as well, it's them. 
Perhaps these two are also on the talisman. Birds are visible on the right, most likely those same crows. And at the end, there is a lighthouse, although I have doubts here. This last symbol resembling the infinity sign is hardly understandable. Perhaps it's again the interweaving of two worlds, and for a fraction of a second, it's difficult to grasp this frame. But we see three portals. From the very beginning, I thought there were three trees with portals. There is logic in this, they were shown to us in the series. But Victor confused me because he specifically said that there are many of them. Also, on the stone talisman, eight such trees are depicted, so in this matter, I am at a loss. What do you think? Share your thoughts in the comments. But there is one but. Victor says that there are special portals. If they all work on the same principle and you enter the portal, you can end up anywhere in a cellar or in a church. But special ones will lead you only to one place, for example, to the lighthouse. I think there are three such portals, and they are located on the three main trees whose roots intertwine, creating that very strange symbol. Now let's consider what is drawn in red. Firstly, there's some kind of ritual again. We see a group of people moving around, or it's just planted forest, or it's a growing crop, but what's important is that we understand the presence of two groups of people, like in that anecdote, reds and whites, they are on different sides of the barricades. Remember, I also mentioned that I doubt if this is a lighthouse? On the left, at the very bottom, a building is drawn in red, which strongly resembles a lighthouse. Even rays of light are visible, so it's possible that there are also two such lighthouses. One is located in the forest of the dreadful place, and the other in the real world, and it serves as a guide. And finally, the most important thing is the creature resembling an octopus, the main antagonist, an ancient god or demon to whom children were sacrificed. Perhaps this creature has no physical form, so it is depicted as a spirit, and it is quite large compared to humans. Black color? At first glance, there isn't much of it here, but it only seems that way. Firstly, the symbol of root connection, sacrificial stones, a fallen tree on the road, even the birds are also drawn in this color. But barely noticeable is also the fact that the forest to the right of the overall picture is also black. Perhaps this shows us that it's safe during the day, but at night, everything is completely different. You can also notice the structure where Boyd found the talismans. It's also drawn in black. I long thought that this might be a map. Later, I realized that the lighthouse is located on the left, where the road is. So there's no logic, and I came to the conclusion that someone simply depicted the history of what happened in this scary place, and this someone is probably not a monster. It was they who created the stone talismans. Let's consider the talisman itself. It's quite simple. Eight trees in a circle, and in the center, two figures, which in my opinion are in different dimensions. The trees and figures are depicted the same, on the stones and in the dungeon. The drawings were created at the same time and by the same person. I think it's more or less clear here. Now let's consider the drawings of Victor and his sister. There's also plenty of information on them. Firstly, much is already clear to us. Victor drew everything he saw, all his memories. The dog that helps everyone, the boy in white, the day of the villager's death, and the portals, and the lighthouse itself. But what I don't understand is this. One of the drawings shows not the past, but the future. It's Boyd, when he found himself trapped after passing through the portal and met Martin. The little figure in the drawing is Boyd, and the color of his jacket is also yellow. I can understand the bottle tree and everything Victor drew to not forget what was happening due to his intellect. But how did he know about something that hadn't happened yet? It's quite strange, although there's no shortage of oddities in this series. Victor's sister Eloisa drew a soldier from the Civil War. Jade had already seen one of them in her visions before her mother left her children and went to help the lighthouse. Strange events had already begun to occur in this town, it didn't all start on one day. So Victor's sister had drawn the lighthouse and the soldier before that. And the last thing they showed us, which must be very important, is the dates in the lighthouse. Four digit numbers all starting with one. These are definitely dates. The first one is 1506. As I understand it, this is the beginning. From this moment, some kind of supernatural entity began to live in the forest. The last one is 1978, the year when Victor was left alone in the town full of the dead. I tried dividing, multiplying, and doing anything with the numbers, but I couldn't find any patterns. If you have any thoughts, write them in the comments. The important part of our analysis of the series today is the events that are happening or are supposed to happen. At first glance, sometimes it seems like we are shown a lot of unnecessary things, and we don't notice the details, although there are plenty of them. For example, when Julie finds a bouquet of flowers on the doorstep of the communal house, it seems like something important, but later this twist reveals for whom these flowers were intended, and who left them. 
Therefore, all the details are important, and all of this is breadcrumbs. Well, I think you understand the meaning. First of all, all people end up in this place in the same way. The road, the tree, the ravens. But here's the strange thing. There are almost no children in the city, except for Eaton. Before him, Victor was such a child. What if the series ends with everyone dying, and Eaton remains alone, as it was with Victor before? And the first such boy is that same boy in white. Secondly, when Julie is brought to the communal house at night, she meets a guy at the doorstep, and it's clear that she knows who he is. He even says something to her. In the following episodes, the guy doesn't appear anymore. We know that their family's youngest brother named Thomas died, and most likely it's him. But how adult Thomas ended up among the monsters is unclear. Therefore, this twist will return in the future. We can also see a similar situation in the dungeon. When Victor finds a toy, an old ceramic one resembling Slappy, often used in horror movies. But what's important is that by his reaction, it's evident that Victor has seen this toy before. He almost lost control for a short time. Jade also sees it in her visions and then stumbles upon it in the dungeon. One of the most important twists is the bracelet made by Tabitha. She finds it in the common storage room, where all unnecessary items left by past residents and those who have already died are kept. How could it have ended up here? Tabitha herself says that she used to make bracelets often, but this one is exactly the one she gave to her husband, Jim. For now, I think Tabitha is Victor's sister. We were made to understand that Eloise, Victor's sister, survived. She found her mother's body near the bottle tree, and the sister managed to go through the tree and end up in the lighthouse, where she managed to leave the city. Perhaps she made the bracelet when she was a child, and it was there all this time, but after she escaped, she forgot everything. Victor also forgets everything. That's why he draws, trying to capture all the information. Moreover, Victor's mother also wore the same bracelet in 1978. There is a second option. At the end of episode 10, Tabitha wakes up in the real world. She finds the lost bracelet at home and clearly wants to return to her family to tell everyone how to escape from the horrible place. But if she succeeds, she will return to the past. The theory is questionable because she definitely had to leave clues for everyone. It would be interesting to see a time loop, but these are just guesses. So the question about the bracelet remains open. A subtle twist is given to us by Elgin. His question about the water and the pond. Fatima sees him near the Brendel's pond. Fatima doesn't even know why it's called that. That's all for now, but in the future, I think someone will want to find out where this pond originates, and this moment with the water must also be important. He was almost drowned in the bathtub. How I love this series for keeping us hooked and giving us so few answers. I want to move on to the fourth important part. Characters, monsters, people, all the components of this horror. And first and foremost, I would like to consider the monsters themselves. All the residents are so frightened that they didn't try to fight them. It was easier to always hide and hope for a miracle. I don't blame them for that. Among them, there are not so many former soldiers like Boyd, resilient to stress, and not everyone could make difficult decisions and take responsibility for others. We know that they were mainly shot at. No one tried, for example, to set the monsters on fire or do something else. I want to start the monster's story from the end, precisely from the part where Boyd met Martin, who had been chained to the wall for decades. Martin dreamed of one thing, to die. So much suffering, so much time. Evil in his blood, the cicada larvae that he passed on to Boyd at the first opportunity sustained life in him. But the main thing is not even that, but what came out of it in the end. We know that Boyd passed blood to the most impressive monster, Smiler, from which he died. All of this made it clear that he had human internal organs. So all the monsters in the past were ordinary people. At first glance, it seems that they have no feelings and intellect but there are a couple of moments proving the opposite. The first is when Smiler sits behind the wheel of a bus, as if he had long dreamed of it, he shows interest. Before that, they mainly tried to deceive and kill, either a child, a lover, or most likely, a lonely guy. In the dungeon, the monsters have personal belongings. The girl who wears a wedding dress puts it on every night. Tabitha found it in a suitcase. There's a bicycle, a television, what's it for? There are even books, which means someone among them reads. I hope you notice that all the monsters are very slow, none of them run. A very important limitation. They can only hunt people at night, when the sun rises. I thought Smiler's corpse would start burning, but no, sunlight doesn't scare them. They just follow the rules. Don't run, only come out at night. And the last rule, do not enter houses and premises where there is a stone talisman. According to available data, at least two members of the group guard the children who are held captive. The purpose of this is not clear yet. Perhaps it was these children that Victor's mother wanted to save when she said she had to help the children locked in the lighthouse. The second character is the chalk boy. In childhood, he helped Victor. Later, he contacted Ethan. 
He also gives advice to Sarah about the portal and what needs to be done to escape. Therefore, this boy is trying to help. He lives in that very lighthouse, can move around the locations during the day using portals for this. And what's even more important, he has a dog that, as I understand it, acts upon his commands, saving Boyd several times. And on the first day of the massacre in the city, she was also with the boy in white. When Tabitha fell into the underground, he told Victor to save her, told him what to do and where to go. Well, in the end, he helped Tabitha to escape. I want to delve into this moment further because many believe that any death will help to escape from the city, that it's just a bad dream. If you follow this logic, then Boyd's wife Abby is alive and she was the first to start helping people. I remind you that Abby was killing everyone indiscriminately, repeating the words that it's just a dream and you need to wake up. Then the monsters are not monsters either. They also help. Sarah's voice in her head commanded her to kill Ethan, that is to save him too. And Boyd is not a hero at all. He only prolongs the suffering of all the settlement's residents. Personally, I believe that the only way to escape is through the lighthouse. Plus, Victor's mother also mentioned it. They found Tabitha in the forest near the road three days ago, alone, which means she hasn't been in the hospital all this time. Therefore, the only way out is the lighthouse. In principle, everything is clear about the other residents, except for Dark Horse, the newly arrived grandmother from the bus. Meet her, her name is Tilly. I'll tell you right away when I saw her, she reminded me of that same grandmother who killed the child in the first episode. Not that I thought about the resemblance, but I still think it's her. They are very similar. This Tilly behaves strangely from the first seconds of her appearance. She seems to be pleased to be in this place, dances, has fun, and behaves too oddly. She knows a lot, especially that Fatima is pregnant. Even if you had 47 grandchildren, it's almost impossible to visually understand at an early stage. And Tilly hasn't known Fatima for so long to allow her to understand her pregnancy. Secondly, she always carries her purse, and I think there's something important in it. And lastly, her prayer. There are seven people in the circle. Again, this number is seven, seven stones, seven children. Well, you understand. The prayer is quite strange, unlike anything else. If you've heard anything similar, please indicate it in the comments. Grandma Tilly is a very strange character, very calm, and it feels like she knows what to do and what will happen. I assure you, in the third season, Grandma will reveal herself even more. Of course, I couldn't overlook the music. It's often used as a trigger in the series. After it plays, something always happens. In the diner, we mainly hear music when there's no one else in the building. The old music box brought a lot of trouble to Boyd and all the residents. When Kelly is found nailed to a tree, the music plays again. And this case is very strange. The monsters didn't tear the girl apart. For the first time, they performed some kind of ritual with the victim. I personally have the impression that the tree takes her life, and we know the forest is alive. And the most interesting case is in the car. I think we were being prepared for a new antagonist. Something was supposed to emerge from under the ground. After the music finishes playing, something so frightening that even the monsters fear it. So, it's something of a higher rank. But some moments remain a mystery. You probably notice that when Tabitha is in the hospital and approaches the window, we see another person in the reflection. It's not Tabitha. What did the creators of the series want to tell us? It's as if they are hinting that Tabitha is not who she appears to be. Throughout the season, they show her connection with Victor. When she sees the ghost children, they say only one word, Ankui. In Latin, the word Ankui translates to here he, she is. Therefore, Tabitha is the one who should help the children. If we follow this information, Victor's mother was going to save the children who were supposed to be sacrificed to the forest, tie them to the stones, and if the seventh child was supposed to be Tabitha and the ritual was not completed, perhaps Victor and Tabitha were supposed to become part of the ritual, and that's why we see them both depicted on the walls of the dungeon. The ritual did not work in 1978 because Tabitha escaped, and she is the key to completing the ritual. Therefore, the children contact her, and she often receives visions. Perhaps the lighthouse incident is not a coincidence, but her memory. The boy in white sends Victor to save her. She is very important to the boy since he helps her so much. It will be very interesting to see how the events unfold in season three. I want to summarize everything we've talked about. In my opinion, there are three main portal trees. Victor calls them special because the forest is constantly moving and there will come a moment when the roots of these special trees will merge. We have seen the symbol of this event many times. What will happen when it occurs, one can only guess. The entity that inhabits this place is everywhere. It feeds not on fear or love, but on hope. Even if the entire city perishes, all the people, then three individuals, tied in the old building located in the anomalous dimension, will feed the power of this place. 
Moreover, this entity knows everything about its victims. It can be said that the information field operates on all those under its control in this place. Therefore, Martin knows what Abby told Boyd. The monsters know everyone's names in the town. And as Martin himself says, it's just the tip of the iceberg. You have no idea what lives in this forest and what it is capable of. There is still a lot of unrevealed twists left for us. Thomas is Julia and Ethan's brother, Tabitha's bracelet, Randall's pond, and Grandma Tilly with her prayers and purse. Plus, Fatima is pregnant. We were not shown what was trying to break through from underground. The leaves started to fall, and as I want to point out, spiders settle on leafless trees, and Victor has already encountered them in childhood. I agree that the series is dragging on. Sometimes it seems to us that some scenes are unnecessary, but I assure you that every dialogue and inexplicable event are important. And I hope that in the third season, we will get more answers. One thing is clear, Tabitha will not be able to live normally outside and will try to save her family, looking for all those who managed to leave the city. I think she is not alone and will find a way to send the bracelet or maybe even return. But at what time? A temporary loop awaits us. What's more, if Tabitha left notes, which are in bottles all over the forest, she visited all temporal periods and created stone talismans. In any case, the series Outside is one of the most mysterious, and I want, just like you, to put together the whole puzzle. So I ask you to write in the comments what interesting things you noticed while watching.